I never would have thought that I would find myself in a situation where my wife would cheat on me and I couldn't do anything about it. We had a prenuptial agreement that didn't allow me to get back at her properly, so I went the other way. And as for me, it was the best revenge. My life is a complete mess. I had just returned home from work when my wife of 12 years, Lisa, began yelling at me. I had anticipated this moment for a while, knowing it would come eventually. To be fair, Lisa had every right to be furious with me. I had been unfaithful. However, in my defense, she had been cheating on me for at least six months before I did. Despite knowing about her infidelity for years, it seems she had only recently discovered mine. As I mentioned, my life is in shambles right now, and I doubt any of you would believe me if I tried to explain it. Honestly, if I weren't experiencing it firsthand, I wouldn't believe it either. Upon opening the front door, Lisa unleashed a piercing scream. You're a pig! From that moment on, things took a turn for the worse. Looking back, I realize her initial outburst was the most forgiving part of her tirade. Though I caught only fragments of her words, it was painfully clear. Lisa had discovered my involvement with another woman and she was furious. Even if I had managed to speak, I doubted anything could defuse the situation. So I stood there silently, staring at the floor, contemplating the quickest exit strategy if things turned violent. Eventually, when Lisa calmed down, she demanded, Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Why shouldn't I just file for divorce? Well, I began softly. Firstly, I know about your affair over the past nine years. So yes, perhaps divorce is the right course of action. What? What are you talking about? Lisa was stunned, her face drained of color. I reached into my briefcase and handed her several photos, evidence of her infidelity. I wasn't sure what to anticipate, but what unfolded completely caught me off guard. To provide context, Lisa is incredibly wealthy and could deploy an army of lawyers against me. Instead of the angry outburst I anticipated, however, Lisa dropped the photos and began to cry. Then she looked at me with a pained and sorrowful expression. What she said next completely astonished me. I don't want a divorce. I love you. With that, she hurried off to our bedroom. Her reaction left me stunned, even more bewildered than usual. Lisa is the most stunning woman I've ever known. I never imagined, not in my wildest dreams, that we would end up together. And after we married, I expected Lisa to eventually tire of our relationship and cast me aside within a year or two. Our marriage had an unusual aspect. Lisa's family was extremely wealthy and insisted on a prenuptial agreement. I agreed, though one condition almost made me reconsider. Lisa insisted on a clause stating we wouldn't have children, which I eventually accepted. Despite my reservations, I was deeply in love with Lisa by then. However, as the story unfolds, I ended up with four kids. Did I mention how chaotic my life became? Some background. Lisa Gravois is my wife and I'm David Todman. She kept her maiden name due to her family's ownership of the prestigious perfume company, Gravois Scents. This decision, which initially bothered me, has actually worked out well over the years. Since we maintain separate last names, many people don't realize we're married, affording me a degree of privacy. At the beginning of our story, I genuinely meant what I said. When Lisa and I got married, I couldn't believe she had chosen me. She was incredibly beautiful then, and she still is now. Lisa stands almost six feet tall with long black hair and the deepest blue eyes imaginable. She had the body of a model. Actually, she did some modeling during her teenage years. I'm not unattractive myself, but I'm no movie star either. I'm just over six feet tall, with sandy-colored hair, and I try to stay in shape. Even so, Lisa was clearly more attractive than me and I was well aware of it. I first met Lisa at a party hosted by my college roommate and his wife in the Hamptons. He worked as a commodities trader and was doing very well for himself. His wife Beth had attended Vassar with Lisa, and they were close friends. 
When I was introduced to Lisa, I was impressed, as were all the other men in the room. She radiates attractiveness and beauty effortlessly. She had all the single guys and most of the married ones captivated. But as I mentioned, she was out of my league, so I began talking to some of the other single women at the party. A friend once advised me to stick to dating women in my league, or even consider those in lower leagues, to avoid wasting time chatting up a woman who would end up leaving with someone else. I know it might sound like a cowardly approach to dating, and I don't fully endorse it myself. But I do have a version of it that I follow. I tend to categorize women based on whether I think they're too good for me or not. Why should I waste time pursuing someone who will reject me anyway? I believe in being realistic. The only exception is if a woman is clearly out of my league but known to be approachable, then I might give it a try. However, throughout that particular night, Lisa seemed to always be near me. At first, I thought it was coincidence, but by the fourth time, it was clear that Lisa was interested in me. I felt flattered, but also uneasy. I assumed she was slumming and would discard me when she got bored. I wasn't interested in being someone's temporary project. Maybe that was her intention, but I didn't let it progress enough to discuss it. Yet after that party, Lisa continued to pursue me. Like I said, I'm decent looking. But why would someone like Lisa Gravois be interested in me? I'm just a software salesman. Don't get me wrong, I'm good at what I do. In just four years at the same company, I became one of the senior sales directors with a mid-five-figure salary. But compared to Lisa's salary of $40 million annually, it's clear why I thought she was just toying with me. Perhaps my initial lack of interest motivated Lisa, but eventually she wore me down. It took her four weeks to convince me to go on a date with her. Another six months passed before we became intimate, and just over a year later, we were married. The wedding was ostentatious beyond belief. 600 guests and a rumored cost of $6 million. Yet such extravagance meant little to one of the heirs to the Gravois fortune. Naturally, her family required me to sign a prenuptial agreement. Lisa seemed embarrassed to ask, but I had no objections. I understood its importance and my own income was substantial, so I wasn't interested in her money. Despite this, Lisa was ecstatic when I agreed to sign. She explained that her family would disown her if she married without it, but she was determined to marry me no matter what. Still, I couldn't shake the thought of how long our marriage would endure. The prenuptial agreement stipulated that in the event of divorce before three years, I would receive only $500,000, which astounded me. I had never heard anyone describe $500,000 as only. However, it improved from there. For each year we remained married beyond three years, I would receive an additional $500,000 or a proportionate amount for the time married. Lisa couldn't make claims on my assets in case of divorce, and vice versa. Yet the best part was the opportunity to be with the most beautiful woman in the world, with the security of at least $500,000 if things went awry. The prenup also specified that we agreed not to have children. Though I eventually accepted this condition, Lisa's parents strongly disapproved of it. Despite this, Lisa had a distant relationship with her parents, seeing them mainly during board meetings. She felt they favored her brothers over her and had already clashed with them over the children issue years ago. As expected, we rarely saw them, and their visits were uncomfortable, particularly for me as I felt judged by them. The initial years of our marriage were genuinely happy, and I believed she loved me during that time. However, shortly after our third anniversary, I discovered that Lisa was unfaithful. Our marriage was quite unconventional. Lisa traveled extensively for her company, often being away about a week every month. In the early years, I tried to accompany her whenever possible. Although there were occasional stretches of five or six weeks when she was home, they were rare. Yet, whenever she returned, she made sure to completely satisfy me in the bedroom. My suspicion of Lisa's infidelity began with a photograph in the newspaper. Given Lisa's public profile, she was frequently featured in the society pages. I diligently checked that section every day. 
One day, a picture from a party in Paris caught my eye, and with a magnifying glass I confirmed my suspicions. There she was, unmistakably, despite her supposed business trip to Japan. You might ask, so what? The issue was that Lisa was meant to be in Japan at that very moment, handling company negotiations. There could have been explanations for her presence in Paris, but I couldn't understand why she would change plans without informing me. I needed more information. Early in our marriage, Lisa had wanted me to quit my job to travel with her, but I resisted becoming financially dependent on her. Over time, she stopped pressing the issue. Marrying into Lisa's family came with significant financial resources, but I was reluctant to access her money out of concern for her meticulous nature. Instead, I relied on my own salary deposited into my personal checking account. I often used these funds to purchase birthday and Christmas gifts for Lisa, a challenging endeavor given her abundance of possessions. My curiosity consumed me, disrupting my sleep and appetite. Determined to uncover the truth, I used my personal funds to hire a private investigation firm. Careful to maintain discretion, I chose a reputable agency from St. Louis that had no prior affiliation with the Gravois companies. After discovering the photo in the newspaper, I realized Lisa was traveling much more than when we first got married. Under her new schedule, she was away for about two weeks every month. Despite this, our bed life remained strong. Lisa appeared genuinely saddened by her trips and delighted upon returning. I almost convinced myself I was being overly suspicious. However, a month later, my suspicions were confirmed. Seeing the report with the pictures was excruciating. It was a pain I had never felt before. According to the private investigator's findings, Lisa's lover was Gerard Lavelle, whose family had extensive banking interests across Europe. Gerard, who was the president of the family's holding company, had grown up with Lisa, and they were once expected to marry. However, they split up, and Lisa married me while Gerard wed Teresa Apopoulos, a Greek woman whose father was heavily involved in shipping. Gerard and Teresa had three children. The report revealed that Gerard and Lisa separated because he wanted children, whereas she was adamant about not having any. Allegedly, Gerard's family threatened to disinherit him if he agreed to Lisa's terms. Furthermore, the report mentioned that Gerard's wife had passed away six months earlier, leaving him free to be with Lisa. I spent five days confused, trying to figure out what was going on. It was clear that Gerard was Lisa's first love, and it looked like they had resumed their relationship. I couldn't understand why Lisa hadn't started the divorce procedure. What confused me even more was the way Lisa showered me with affection every time she returned home. If I didn't know her better, I'd think she only loves me. Lisa not only seemed genuinely happy when she saw me, but our closeness was incredible. You can begin to understand how confusing my life was, and it only got worse. My first reaction after receiving the private investigator's report was to want to meet Lisa face to face and end our marriage. However, after much thought, three reasons kept me from taking this step. First of all, I still loved Lisa, and when we were together, I believed that her love for me was sincere. Secondly, our physical relationship was amazing. Finally, a prenuptial agreement was concluded. From a practical point of view, staying married to Lisa meant earning one $370 a day. In the end, I made the decision after Lisa tried to put me to bed before leaving for another trip. I thought to myself, forget it, I'll stay married, but I won't be faithful. Even after making this decision, I struggled with the idea of actually cheating on Lisa. One day, when I was thinking about this dilemma, one of the saleswomen looked into my office. Her name was Thelma Johnson, and she was quite attractive. Although Thelma couldn't match Lisa's attractiveness, she had a great figure and friendly manners. David, you've seemed thoughtful all week, she said. Is there anything I can do to help? I really admired Thelma. She was a wonderful saleswoman. Recently divorced, she caught her husband with the postwoman on the kitchen table, after which she quickly received both a divorce and a new table. Surprisingly, Thelma seemed less depressed by the divorce than expected. Finding her husband in such a situation was not new to her. 
Thelma and I worked closely for more than six months to sign a contract with Harris Enterprise, which guaranteed us bonuses for a year. Although I knew that Thelma was interested in me, we maintained a purely professional relationship. However, knowing that she can listen, I asked her for advice about my dilemma with Lisa. Yes, I admitted. I was confused. I just found out that Lisa is cheating on me. The question is, should I divorce her or turn a blind eye to it? It should be obvious, Thelma replied quickly. Divorce this woman and move on. It's not that simple, I explained. Lisa and I have a prenuptial agreement. Every year while I'm married, I earn $500,000. So every day I stay married means I pocket almost one four hundred dollars which is important. I then listed all the additional benefits of staying married to Lisa. The luxury cars, extravagant parties, designer clothes, expensive watches, and travel on the company jet. Thelma acknowledged that these were significant factors to consider. She promised to ponder it that evening and inform me of any insights. The next day, I was still grappling with my dilemma when Thelma entered my office and closed the door. I might have a solution to your problem, she said, taking a seat opposite me. Really? What do you think I should do about Lisa? I inquired. I think you should remain with her, Thelma replied, adding, with a few adjustments. Oh, what adjustments do you propose? I asked, intrigued. I assumed Thelma might suggest I stay married and discreetly see someone else. Although I was leaning toward that option, I hadn't fully committed. Despite still caring deeply for Lisa, her betrayal had wounded me profoundly, making it difficult to reconcile. But Thelma's suggestion took me completely by surprise. I believe you should stay married to Lisa but have an affair of your own. I stopped her by raising my hand. I've already thought about it, I told her. No, my plan goes beyond that, Thelma interjected. Please let me explain and finish before you kick me out of your office. All right. I conceded, holding out my hands to her. The stage is yours. David, I think this decision is difficult for you for two reasons, Thelma began. First of all, despite Lisa's actions, you still love her. You can't imagine life without her. Secondly, even if you are thinking about having an affair, it will not satisfy your main desire. You have mentioned several times that you really want children. Just having an affair won't satisfy your craving. It's all true, I interjected but I don't see how that solves my dilemma. I believe I can be the solution, Thelma said warmly, smiling at me. What? Are you offering to become my mistress? Technically, yes, she replied with a sly grin, but I want a lot more. I'm not sure I like where this is going, I admitted worriedly. No, David, please listen to me. I nodded for her to continue. You knew me before you and Lisa got married, Thelma continued. I know you think that Lisa married an unworthy man, but I never thought so. She's incredibly lucky to have you, and it's stupid of her to risk losing you. But since she chose this path, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. You know that my dating history was, to put it mildly, sad. I think I've always dated the worst men. I had my doubts even before I got married last year. I felt that Fred and I were not right for each other, but at first he seemed kind and loving. It was only after we got married that I discovered that he was a jealous and domineering man and couldn't be faithful. I simply nodded and allowed Thelma to continue. I've always been drawn to you, but it seemed you were never interested in me. We've been close friends for years, but you never saw me romantically. I accepted that, especially when Lisa entered the picture. But now with Lisa leaving the door ajar, I want to see if I can step through before it closes. Up to this point, Thelma hadn't explained how her plan differed from simply being a mistress. You've mentioned wanting two things, Lisa and having children. Lisa's betrayal has hurt you deeply, and you want to retaliate. Yet despite not making a big deal about it, I know you also desire children. I can offer both. After my failed marriage, I swore off remarriage, but still yearned to have children. I suggest becoming your mistress and having your children. I understand you don't love me, but I believe you care. We would 
keep our affair discreet, allowing you to remain with Lisa while I have your children. It's a win-win for both of us. I have to admit Thelma's proposal both shocked and intrigued me. It seemed pretty messed up, but I found myself drawn to the idea. However, I could foresee several challenges with it, so I started to outline a few. Firstly, thank you for this offer, I said sincerely. I'm genuinely flattered and it's more generous than I could have expected, but I see a number of issues. Let me outline them. Managing finances would be complex. Then there's the matter of raising children, deciding on their surname, and what if you change your mind later and want to marry? I've thought about the same challenges, Thelma conceded, but let me try to address them. Regarding finances, I own my own house. All I would ask is that we share the costs of raising any children. I would want your name on the birth certificates as the father, but they would carry my surname unless you decide otherwise. While I don't foresee marrying again, I understand things can change. So I suggest we draft a formal agreement. We can include a clause allowing either of us to terminate it with six months' notice. If I do remarry, you would have a say in custody. If you decide to end our arrangement, I would have custody, but you'd have generous visitation rights. In any case, you would always be recognized as the father. We sat silently, exchanging glances. In the end, I broke the silence. I must admit I was very intrigued by your proposal. However, I'm not ready for any commitments yet. Why don't we go on a few dates to see if we're right for each other? Thelma agreed, and we started dating. Our first trips were simple. Dinner and dancing, then dinner, and going to the theater. Spending time with Thelma was pleasant. She was warm and cheerful, which was a pleasant change compared to waiting for Lisa to return from trips at home. On our fifth date, when I was dropping Thelma out of the car, the situation escalated to the limit and we began to hug. After our sixth date, Thelma said, We're definitely good for each other on dates. Now let's see if we're suitable in bed. Being close to Lisa was stressful, so I wasn't sure what to expect from Thelma, and I can say for sure that it was awesome. We repeated our intimacy twice more before I returned home. I expected to feel guilty for betraying Lisa, but strangely enough, this did not happen. Talking to Thelma has somewhat cured my wounded pride. The next day, Thelma came to my office beaming. After closing the door, she came up to me and kissed me passionately. I think after last night we confirmed our compatibility, so what's our next step? I smiled broadly. Why don't you find a lawyer who is not related to my company or to any of Lisa's businesses? Ask them to prepare an agreement, and then we will decide what to do next. Thelma smiled broadly. I only know the lawyer, my brother Tim. You can rely on him. He warned me against marrying Fred. So Thelma left and I returned to work. As time passed, I found myself thinking about the idea less frequently. Since Thelma didn't bring it up again, I thought she might have changed her mind. Either way, I wasn't going to initiate the topic. Besides, I was leaning more towards divorcing Lisa and accepting the financial consequences. At least it wouldn't be as bad as what many husbands experience in divorces, often getting the short end of the stick. In many instances, these men probably deserve it. However, in many others, it's the wife who should face severe repercussions. In my situation, I'd at least come out of it with a substantial amount of money. Two weeks after our discussion, Thelma walked into my office and closed the door. She placed the finalized agreement on my desk. Take all the time you need to review it. Make any changes you want. If we both agree, we'll sign it in front of my brother who will arrange the witnesses and notary. I was surprised because Thelma hadn't mentioned the proposal since our last encounter and we hadn't seen each other socially. I had assumed the idea was abandoned. Yet here was the agreement, right in front of me. It's remarkable how quickly my thoughts returned to considering Thelma as my lover and potentially starting a family with her. Thelma's brother had been incredibly thorough. He covered details that neither Thelma nor I had ever considered. 
One that particularly struck me was the plan for what would happen to the children if something happened to either Thelma or me. That thought chilled me to the bone. Tim's solution was straightforward. If Thelma were to pass away, Tim and his wife would raise the children if I chose to continue my relationship with Lisa. If I decided to acknowledge the children at that point, I would have custody of them. Alternatively, if I stayed with Lisa, I would still have full access to any children Thelma and I might have, and they would be informed of my paternity if they hadn't been already. In the event of my death, the children would take my last name and my estate would be left to them, managed in a trust until they turned 25. I was still grappling with my decision when Lisa informed me one Monday that her travel schedule would increase the following year. That settled it for me. The next day, I asked Thelma to arrange a meeting with her brother. The meeting with Tim was very businesslike. Despite any personal feelings he might have had about the arrangement, it was evident he cared deeply for his sister and wanted her happiness. David, you're one lucky guy, Tim remarked with a shake of his head. I've seen photos of your wife. She's stunning. And Thelma, she's a real beauty, too. Man, I'm jealous. I grinned at Tim's comment, but Thelma shot him a stern look. Tim, Gloria is a beautiful woman, and you're lucky to have her. I know, sis, Tim replied with a laugh, but it would be even better if my secretary wanted to make such a deal. He quickly added, just kidding. Gloria is more than enough for me. Besides, she'd kill me if I suggested something like that. Thelma seemed pleased and smiled. We focused on the agreement again. One of the points provided for the organization of our meetings at a time when Lisa was away. To my delight, Thelma looked amazing in her plush attire that first night. Her body was warm and sensual. After that, we took our time and by morning we were both happy and a little annoyed. In the office, Thelma and I maintained a strictly professional relationship. She openly stated that she no longer goes on dates and intends to get pregnant artificially. Three months after our first meeting, Thelma called me and informed me that she was pregnant. We maintained our intimate life as long as possible during the pregnancy. When Thelma went to the hospital for delivery, I was disappointed that I couldn't be there. However, it simply wasn't feasible with Lisa at home. Nevertheless, as soon as it was appropriate, I visited the hospital to see Thelma and our new son, Gavin. The name Gavin was a tribute to her grandfather. Eighteen months later, Jennifer was born, and it was then that Thelma asked if I would support her decision to be a full-time mother. She assured me she had financial resources to sustain us for five years, until both kids started school. I expressed my happiness that she could devote herself to our children. I even arranged to cover Thelma's mortgage and utilities from a fund I had kept secretly. We hadn't planned on having more children, but Lisa's travel coincided with Thelma's ovulation unexpectedly. She had miscalculated the days. Thelma tearfully called me one day to share the news of her pregnancy, fearing my reaction. Instead, I reassured her of my love for her and all our children. Scotty was born while Lisa was away, so I was present in the delivery room for his birth. I was overjoyed and felt like I was on cloud nine for days. Before our third child was born, Thelma and I decided to prevent further pregnancies. We flipped a coin to decide whether I would have a vasectomy or Thelma would undergo two-ball ligation. It landed on heads, so Thelma had her tubes tied. Everything seemed to be going well until Lisa's travels abruptly ceased. This disrupted Thelma and my plans. If Lisa wasn't away, possibly cheating with Gerard, I felt uneasy about spending time with Thelma. It may not make sense, but our entire situation was bewildering. Until Lisa stopped traveling, she appeared content. I was happy, and Thelma was thrilled. As the weeks turned into months, both Lisa and Thelma grew increasingly frustrated with me. Lisa wanted us to spend more time together, feeling that we had drifted apart and wanting to reconnect. Meanwhile, Thelma was upset because we hadn't been intimate in nearly six weeks. Even though I was still physically involved with Lisa, my guilt was affecting our relationship, causing performance issues or even avoidance at times. 
My life felt completely chaotic, and I didn't know how to unravel it. Then one day I returned home to discover that Lisa had found out about my infidelity. You're probably right. Maybe we should get a divorce, I said, feeling a strange sense of relief, thinking it might be a way out of my mess. Lisa looked at me with utter shock and began to cry. She expressed her love for me and insisted she didn't want a divorce, then rushed to our bedroom in tears. Her reaction caught me completely off guard. I followed her to continue the conversation and found her lying face down on our bed, sobbing uncontrollably. I sat down beside her and pulled her close. You were right, Lisa. We've been growing apart for years. I thought you wanted a divorce. No, I don't want a divorce, she managed to say. Then why did you bring it up? I asked, completely bewildered. I thought it might shock you into realizing we need to fix our marriage, Lisa said, tears streaming down her face. Oh, I murmured, unsure how to respond. Listen, Lisa, I began, running my hand nervously through my hair. I've known about your relationship with Gerard for years. I assumed you were ready to commit to him. Oh my God, no, she gasped. Why didn't you ever say anything? Initially, I was so hurt that I planned to confront you and seek a divorce, I explained. But I realized it would hurt me financially. More than that, I still loved you deeply. I was in so much pain that I almost filed for divorce anyway. Then a colleague at work showed me another path. Lisa struggled to process this revelation. Until now, she had no idea I knew about her affair, just as I had remained unaware of hers until recently. So... You've been having an affair, Lisa cried, tears staining her cheeks. You despicable liar, leave me and never come back. The situation was becoming more and more surreal. Why was she mad at me for having an affair when she started it before me? I decided this was the right moment to leave quickly and spend time with Thelma and the kids. The whole situation was so confusing that I couldn't imagine it could get any worse. But I was wrong. When I arrived at Thelma's, she practically attacked me. Before I could explain anything, she dragged me into the bedroom, and we had two rounds. We finally got to talking after Thelma came to her senses. I thought you weren't interested anymore, she said softly. When Lisa was around all the time, I thought I'd lost you. I was going crazy, imagining life without you. Then I told Thelma about my strange conversation with Lisa and her emotional outburst. It made Thelma cry. My head was spinning so much that I felt dizzy. Why are you crying now? I asked when she calmed down a bit. Because it's obvious that she's still head over heels in love with you and will do anything to get you back and keep you. It doesn't make any sense, I said. First of all, Lisa told me to leave. Secondly... She had a happy affair for eight or nine years. How could she suddenly fall in love with me? I do not know, Thelma sobbed. But something has changed, and she definitely wants to keep you. It's unfair. She left you, and I want you. It all made no sense, so I kissed Thelma, made love to her again, and then went to bed. In the morning we made love again, and then I went to the office. Maybe there I could start to untangle the mess that my life has become. But you know the saying, the best laid plans of mice and men. Well, that morning was a perfect example. When I got to the office, Lisa was already there, sitting in my chair with a grim expression. Good morning, Lisa, I greeted cautiously. I don't recall you ever coming into my office before. What brings you here today? You know exactly why I'm here. Lisa snapped. We need to talk about your affair. With that, I swiftly closed the door and took a seat. All right, what do you want to discuss? Firstly, who is she? Her name is Thelma Johnson. She used to work with me. Wait, did you hire a private investigator or something? No, a friend of mine saw you being affectionate in a restaurant the other day. They tried to follow your girlfriend after you passionately kissed her but lost her. Do you plan on continuing to see her? Oh boy, 
was all I could muster. Well, do you plan on continuing to see her? Lisa, you're not going to like what I have to say, but you need to hear it. After I explain everything, I think we'll both agree that a divorce is necessary. Sadness filled Lisa's eyes, but she nodded. If only you had continued with your travels, we wouldn't be having this conversation, I started. What do my trips have to do with any of this? Lisa asked sharply. I told you I knew about Gerard, Lisa, I interrupted. I know you meet him during your trips, so Thelma and I would meet while you were away. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. My attempt at a joke was unsuccessful, so I continued. Since you were having an affair, I thought I might as well. I tried to do it only when you weren't at home. But eventually we started doing extra classes when Thelma was in a state of conception so she could get pregnant. You have a child! Lisa screamed, jumping to her feet. Please keep your voice down and sit down, I demanded. No, we don't have a child, we have three. And before you say anything, you know that I've always wanted children and you haven't. After several tense minutes of trying to get an answer from Lisa, she finally spoke. I understand. I need to think about all this. With that, she left. I thought it wouldn't be long before the company's lawyers started drafting divorce papers. Meanwhile, not wanting to incur Lisa's wrath, I stayed with Thelma. That night with Thelma brought me relief, and yes, we were close. And yes, I enjoyed every minute of this evening. But the next morning, Lisa called me at the office. I assumed it was a courtesy call informing me that the divorce papers were coming, but what Lisa proposed caught me completely off guard. She wanted to meet Thelma and my children. Listen, Lisa, I took a firm stance. I understand you're angry with me and we can debate whether it's justified, but I won't let you involve my kids. And I certainly won't tolerate any mistreatment of them or Thelma. David, she replied calmly. I swear on everything sacred to me I won't do anything to embarrass, insult, demean, or harm your children, Thelma, or you. I genuinely want to meet your kids and I really need to talk to Thelma. I'll have a fully vetted nanny to care for the children while we talk. After we meet, if you still want to proceed with the divorce, I'll fully respect our agreement. I pondered for a moment and decided that meeting with Lisa might expedite everything. But I knew it could turn messy quickly if she upset my kids or Thelma. All right, I'll need to check with Thelma, I said, but if she agrees, where and when do you propose we meet? How about at our house tomorrow morning at 10? Thelma wasn't keen on meeting Lisa. She worried that seeing them together might sway me in Lisa's favor. I just shrugged and told her it would speed up the divorce process. The next day, I drove Thelma and my three kids to my house with Lisa. Thelma seemed overwhelmed by the grandeur of the estate. The kids were thrilled. I had promised them a swimming pool, game room, and an ice cream bar. I decided to ring the bell instead of just walking in as usual. To my surprise, Lisa herself answered the door. Normally, during the day, there were at least three servants in the house who would do that. David, Lisa said, smiling, you don't need to ring the bell to enter your own home. I wasn't sure how I'd be received, I admitted quietly. Lisa then introduced us to a friendly, heavy-set, middle-aged woman. This is Helen, Lisa said, introducing the nanny. She's taking the children out to the pool. We'll be in the kitchen where we can keep an eye on them. Once in the kitchen, Lisa offered us drinks. I had a strong desire for a scotch, but considering the circumstances, I opted for a Pepsi instead. Thelma chose water, while Lisa poured herself a glass of wine. I couldn't help feeling it was unfair. Had I known alcohol was an option, I would have chosen differently. Thelma, Lisa began. David mentioned you've been together for about eight years? We've managed what we could, Thelma replied anxiously. David insisted we only meet when you were away, though he'd often drop by for an hour or two to see the kids. He never missed their events. Lisa gave me an odd glance. So... Are you happy with David? Don't you wish for a full-time husband? She asked. David is the best man I've ever known, Thelma stated firmly. He's a better husband and father part-time than most men would be full-time. So, 
No, I don't want a full-time husband. I want whatever David can give me. I understand, Lisa said, a tear rolling down her cheek. She wiped it away hastily and turned to me. Would David mind checking on the kids so Thelma and I can have some privacy? I glanced at Thelma. Though clearly nervous, she nodded in agreement. I had opted for shorts that day since I had taken time off. I slipped off my sandals and dipped my legs into the pool. Watching the kids playfully splashing about, I couldn't help but wish Lisa had wanted children and hadn't betrayed me. Occasionally, I glanced back through the kitchen window. Initially, it appeared Lisa was doing all the talking. Then Thelma started speaking and Lisa appeared tearful. They exchanged words while Thelma seemed to jot something down. Finally, I witnessed them embracing, both in tears. Lisa then slid open a door and called me back inside. I hesitated, almost afraid to comply. Once indoors, I was gestured back to my earlier seat. I briefly wondered if drinks were still an option, but decided not to test my luck. David, Thelma began, taking my hand. We've reached an agreement. Okay, I replied cautiously. Is this something I'm not going to like? We'll let you decide, Lisa said. Our agreement is to share you. Talk about being caught off guard. I arrived this morning expecting to finalize the details of Lisa and my divorce. Instead, I was informed that the two women in my life wanted to share me. I'm not sure about this, I replied, pushing my chair back slightly. Lisa, you cheated on me for nearly nine years. And yes, I cheated on you for almost as long. But you started it. I don't understand why you don't want to be with Gerard all the time. If you divorce me, you're free to do that. Lisa started crying, and Thelma punched my arm. Why did you hit me, I demanded, growing even more confused and a little angry. Because Gerard is dead, Thelma said. Oh, I'm sorry, I murmured. I didn't know. David, you're right, I cheated on you, Lisa admitted. Gerard was my first love, and I didn't get over him until I met you. He broke up with me when I told him I didn't want children. I was devastated by his decision, but I refused to give in. About three years into our marriage, I ran into Gerard during one of my trips. His wife had passed away, and he was in deep grief. I wanted to support him through that difficult time. He truly loved Teresa. One thing led to another, and we began an affair. Yes, I loved Gerard, but I loved you just as much, maybe more. At the time of Gerard's heart attack, he was urging me to leave you and marry him. I told him I would never leave you. I loved you too much. Now I couldn't bear it if you left me, David. And I know you still love me, even though you have a family with Thelma. So it's possible to love two people at the same time. I understand now that I can't have you all to myself. But like Thelma, I want whatever you're willing to give me. I exhaled heavily and sank into my chair. While many guys might consider this scenario a dream come true, all I could foresee was potential disaster. Every fiber of my being screamed that two women vying for the same man was a recipe for trouble. I glanced between Lisa and Thelma, seeing a mix of hope and anxiety in their eyes. So I decided to feign ignorance. How exactly would this work? I inquired. At that, Thelma produced a notepad and began outlining the schedule. The agreement was quite detailed. Lisa would occupy the master bedroom, while Thelma and the kids would have the north wing with three bedrooms and two baths. I would stay with Thelma on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights, and with Lisa on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday nights. Sundays were free for me to sleep wherever I chose. The arrangement didn't dictate constant intimacy. Those details were left up to the couples. Crucially, if one woman declined intimacy, I couldn't seek it with the other. There were numerous other rules, but those were the fundamentals. I told them I needed time to consider. I was deeply skeptical about the entire proposition. However, both women insisted it was either sharing or nothing. I doubted that ultimatum. It seemed likely either woman would gladly have me exclusively. But then paranoia crept in. 
What if they were serious about sharing or nothing? Could I end up losing both women? Regardless, I had a trip planned the next day, so I promised to give them my answer upon my return. I was surprised at how effectively I could work, despite the impending great changes in my life. But when I finished my contract with Stellar Enterprises and flew home, I realized the reason for my productivity on this trip. I had already made a decision. I agreed to the deal. Thelma returned to her brother to draft a new agreement. His eyes almost popped out when she explained what was going on. After Thelma finished outlining the deal, his first reaction was, Damn it, David. I hate you with every fiber of my being. Of course, I knew he was joking, so I teased him back. You could always find yourself a lover, I suggested, for which I immediately received a slap on the head from Thelma. I wouldn't dare, Tim admitted. The agreement seemed to be working successfully, until almost seven months had passed. I can't say that my bed life has become more intense, but it has become more consistent. Thelma returned to work in my office, where a babysitter was looking after the children. Lisa was a little annoyed at first, but solved the problem to her satisfaction by hiring Thelma from me with a higher salary and benefits. Now Thelma works for Lisa and seems to be quite happy. About a week before the seventh month, as soon as I arrived home from work, the two women pulled me aside. They informed me there was an issue with our agreement that needed adjusting. In my mind, I thought, Oh Lord, what now? Can my life get any more chaotic? The answer was apparently, yes. Seated at the dining room table, Lisa wasted no time in getting to the point. David, I want to have a baby. Confusion doesn't even begin to cover my reaction, but by now you all know this is a perpetual state for me living with these two women. If I were to speculate for eternity about what they wanted to discuss, I never would have imagined it would be Lisa wanting a child. I know I said I wasn't interested in having kids, Lisa said softly. But, seeing how happy you are with yours and how much they adore you and vice versa, I want to experience that too. So what was I supposed to say? All I managed was, okay. Apparently that was the right response because both women erupted in joy, embracing and kissing me. Then Lisa dropped the bombshell. Also, David, Thelma and I have been talking, and we agree that I shouldn't stay married to you. That threw me into panic mode. It sounded like these two women wanted me to father Lisa's child and then discard me. I knew they had grown close, but I never anticipated they would develop feelings for each other and want to push me aside. Let me make sure I understand, I said, turning to Lisa. You're asking me to father your child, but afterward, you both intend to end our relationship. I'm not sure I want to be part of that. If you want me to leave, just say so, and I'll go peacefully. But if you think I'll accept being cut off from my children, I'll fight you on that. What? Thelma exclaimed, her voice rising sharply. No, David, that's not it at all, Lisa hurriedly responded, her face turning red. It's my fault. I didn't explain properly. David, we don't want to push you away, Thelma interjected, moving to hug me. I love you deeply. It would devastate me if you left. David, I feel the same, Lisa added tearfully. Well then... I'm completely lost as to what you're both talking about, I said with frustration. I need a drink. I don't care what's available. I think we could all use a drink, Lisa said, taking my hand. Once we're calmer, I'll try to clarify our intentions, but David, please know that we'll respect whatever decision you make. All right, Lisa, I said after downing my first scotch. Tell me about the baby first. Are you sure this is what you want? It's a big decision. Among all the topics discussed by those women prior to our arrangement, the idea of having another baby wasn't one of them. However, after witnessing the joy Thelma and I experienced with our children, Lisa's maternal instincts seemed to awaken. Over time, her desire to have a child of her own became overpowering. This development required us to adjust our agreement so that Lisa could spend more time with me, especially during her fertile periods. Tim was utterly shocked when we informed him of this latest change we needed.
He kept expressing his dislike for me until I reminded him of what it's like to have a newborn. It took four months, but eventually, Lisa became pregnant and gave birth to a beautiful baby girl named Charlotte, who inherited her mother's eyes and my smile. Thelma and the children absolutely adore her. As for the proposed divorce, it was just another twist in my tumultuous married life. When Lisa mentioned the idea of not being married to me, it was simply another aspect of the unpredictable terms of our arrangement. To be specific, Lisa wasn't initially suggesting an immediate divorce, nor was she suggesting a permanent separation. In one of their many conversations, Thelma expressed concern about the stigma that might come from having children born out of wedlock. Lisa agreed and proposed a solution. Keep in mind Lisa has considerable wealth, which can often facilitate solutions. The new arrangement stipulated that I would divorce Lisa after our child was born. Then I would marry Thelma. But Lisa would ensure that the paperwork showed we were married during the births of our children. Afterward, Thelma and I would divorce, and I would remarry Lisa. If this sounds confusing, imagine how I felt. Some of you may be considering the financial aspects of the prenup. Honestly, it never crossed my mind, but Lisa thought about it. She ensured the agreement was drafted to preserve its terms regardless of our relationship status changes. By then, though, money wasn't my concern. I was already guaranteed $5 million from the original agreement. Through wise investments over the years, I had accumulated another $6 million. Still, it was reassuring that Lisa was attentive to my interests. After Charlotte was born, I signed divorce papers and married Thelma. Somehow, Lisa managed to update the marriage license and records to show my supposed marriage to Thelma. I questioned why she didn't just change the records without the ceremony, but she explained it was a women's thing, so I didn't press further. I remained married to Thelma for a year before divorcing and remarrying Lisa. Then, after another year, I divorced Lisa and married Thelma again. I can't explain why. They simply told me they both enjoyed being officially married to me. The only downside to Lisa having a child was that her parents started visiting more frequently to see their new grandchild. This disrupted our living arrangement and I suspected Lisa's parents weren't convinced by her explanation that she needed her administrative assistant nearby. I often caught them glancing at me when they thought I wasn't looking. Lisa's mother with admiration and her father with clear envy. You might be wondering how the kids felt about our unconventional family. When they were young, they probably didn't think much about it. As they grew older, they were told their mothers were close friends, and I had been married to each of them at different times. The details beyond that were kept vague. When the kids reach their teenage years, they'll likely realize ours isn't a typical family. Tim calls me every couple of months for updates. I think he lives vicariously through me. I know our situation is incredibly complicated, but I love my children and my wives. Thankfully, we have enough money to make it all work. As I mentioned earlier, my life is incredibly messed up, but it's a mess in a strangely positive way.